Romans 13, again, we've come to a place where Paul is now exhorting the church on the do's and the don'ts, okay? I talk about this all the time where, you know, the Bible does have commands for Christians. There are things that Christians are supposed to do and things that Christians are not supposed to do. And the reason why we teach right through the books of the Bible is because we don't want you to get that convoluted. We, we don't want people to come into church every week and hear a message on, don't do this, don't do that, and don't do this. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Well, if you read Paul's epistles, they always start off with Jesus has, with what Jesus has done for us. The way he loves us. He came for us. He died for us. He fulfilled all of the law for us. Everything he did was to glorify his father and we got the benefit for it, of it. It was for us. Now, if you read the epistles correctly, Paul's writings, once you get all of that, it's because Jesus has done so much for you. Now, what can I do for God? You respond to God with the way that you live your life. God's the initiator. We're the responder. It's not the opposite. It's not the opposite. It's not, God, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. Now you got to do this for me. God, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm, I'm being a good little church goer. I'm, 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 I'm carrying a Bible. And if you're really holy, it's a King James Bible. That was, that was a joke. That was a joke, but that's the one I read from. All right? And, and if you do this, this, and this, you know, God, I've been doing these things. Now, I, you know, I, I, more of your love, more of this, more of that, more provision. Well, well the, the Bible tells it the opposite, that God already loves us. He has already done something for us in sending his son. He ever lives right now for us to make intercession for us. He's always doing something for us. He initiates the love. We respond to that. And that's what Romans 1 through Romans 11 is all about. All of God's love, his grace, his mercy, his plan of salvation for the whole human race and for the future of Israel. And finally, by the time you get to Romans 12, it's okay. What can you do for God now? You respond in giving your life to him. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that's the least we can do. It's our reasonable service. We lay down our lives to love and to serve Jesus Christ, not because we're getting something from him, but because he already gave his life for us. And then you start to get into, Paul starts to talk about, all right, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, then this is what it should look like. You're not as hateful anymore. You're starting to have some more patience. You're starting to respond to people in love and in grace instead of wrath and anger. Now, those things still come out here and there, but on the whole, you're growing in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's changes that have happened in your heart and in your life, and little by little, some people all at once in some areas, some people it takes a long time, but that's God's work in His way, and He's in control of it. But the point is, you're not the same. God's moving. There's a difference. God has done something in your heart. He's done something in your life. And that's how we respond. So remember, as we went through chapter chapter 12, he talked about our relationship with one another in the church. The way we the way that we treat one another. The way that we forgive one another and forbear. And God has given us gifts now that we're saved as you move through Romans 12. Are we Are we using them? Are we loving one another? Are we serving one another? Are we ministering to one another? Are we giving to the work of the ministry? Are we doing all those things? And then he gets into, well, if we're really saved and if we love the Lord Jesus Christ and if we're responding to him, not only is that going to overflow in the way we treat one another, but it's going to overflow outside the walls of the church with unbelievers in relation to the government, in relation to the world. But let's be honest. Sometimes we walk around so angry at the outside world. The way this country is going, oh, what's going on? And I get like that too. But people that are not saved are just doing what people that are not saved do. Living for this world. 
thinking that they have the answers to the problems in this world, which they don't. They've been trying for over 6,000 years and they haven't figured it out yet. That's why Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world. I'm not going to set up my kingdom this way, the way you think. If it were, my servants would fight. It's not of this world. It's not like the way you're thinking. And then he's going to get into Romans 13. That if we are renewing our mind, if God is working in and through us now, if we're being remembered, transformed from the inside out, again, things are going to change the way we treat one another, the way we look at God and the way we react to the outside world. Now, again, let's be honest. I pull out there and I get angry. Somebody cuts me off. It doesn't matter that I was speeding or doing something wrong. It's still their fault. It is just their fault. And it's difficult sometimes, and it's painful as we watch our nation and what's going on in our nation move away from the Judeo-Christian ethic. It does. It gets, gets me angry, but it shouldn't get me angry. It should make me sad. It should drive me to my knees to seek the Lord for the salvation of souls, for the future of this country, for our children's sake, and what they're going to be involved in, and what they're going to have to endure. Listen, if you read about the history of the children of Israel, listen to me, it wasn't the nation that fell under the judgment that started to turn from God. It was always three, four, five, six, seven generations later because God was patient, patient, patient. But finally, someone's children and their children fell under the chastising hand of God. And I'm afraid that's going to be, it's starting now and it's going to be my kids or your grandkids. But we shouldn't get angry about that. It should drive us to our knees in prayer to make a difference. Listen, if revival is going to come, it's not going to be through the political field. It's not going to be by Christians protesting. Though it's okay if you do that. I'm not knocking you if you do some of that stuff. But if you do it, you do it in love. If you do it, you do it in grace. If you do it, you do it not to beat someone over the head with God's word. It's to speak the truth in love, right? So another evidence as we move through this, we've already seen so far an evidence is of being transformed by the renewing of your mind from the inside out. Remember Paul says in Romans 12, one and two, he goes, don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world's pressures and the world's ways and the world system conform you to their way of thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he goes into the different evidences of the fact that you're being transformed. One is the way we treat one another. Two is the way we use our gifts in the body of Christ. Three is the way we treat people outside. Four, Romans 13, how do we react to the government? Chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul, he's talking to Christians, be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that, are, that, that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the, resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will you then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. For he that's human governments, is the minister of God to you for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. This is what he says here. He's saying this, that human governments, as corrupt as they are, if they were not there, evil would not be restrained at all. Stay with me. Let me say that again. Human governments, even communism, socialism, capitalism, and the way that the militaries are all set up, the police departments, all those things, as corrupt as they can be, if they were not in place, evil would be more evil, if that makes sense. Okay? So human government is the lesser of the two evils. Okay? God is for tyranny more than he is for anarchy. Okay? That's what he said. 
And he says all those powers are ordained of God. That means God is allowing them to be in place. And listen, one word that we need to see here, and he uses it a couple times, as Christians, if we're saved, if we're born again of the Spirit, if we're on our way to heaven, that should categorize us is the word subject. 13.1, subject. 13.5, subject. You know what that means? Sub, you put yourself under. Now listen, I like the fact That in Jesus Christ, I'm not subject to anybody except for him. But if I am subject to him, I'm going to be subject to other people. I'm going to put myself under another pastor. I'm going to put myself under the government. Listen to what they say or pay my fines when I have to pay them. As much as I don't want to. And, and, and some of you here know me. I'm a, I'm a church and, you know, separation of church and state kind of guy. Separation of state from the church. That's how they originally intended it, by the way. Now, listen. So when people in the government and, you know, we're building a building program and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a studier, all right, because I know that they sometimes think that they have more power than the church and, and they think it's written in certain places and it's not. So I study. I do my homework and I go down there with the laws and I say, well, you really can't do that. This is what the, you know, the laws state. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. And I say, no, no, listen, this is really what it states. We're the church, you know, we can do some of these things. And they say, oh, oh, oh all, right, all right, whatever. <laughs> so I'm subject, but I'm not going to be subject to something that's outside of the laws, though. Understand? And we need to do our homework. But the scriptures say, listen, and again, the, in the first century, what was it? It was an absolute monarchy. It was tyrannical, Nero, killing Christians. The Christians were supposed to obey, pay their tribute, do all those things under a tyrannical government. They had to do those things. How much more should we? I don't like it. But in evidence that you belong to the king of kings and lord of lords is that you have a mind that is subject. Now listen to me. <laughs> it makes me laugh. Because sometimes people come into the church, right? And they think that I gotta li- we got to listen to you know, all them out there, the police officers. We got to listen to the governmental figures. But when they come into the church, there's also an authority structure. And they say, we don't have to listen to you, though. We don't have to listen to elders and deacons. I know as much as the Bible as they know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, that's why God's not using you that much, because of the spirit that you have within you. You don't have a teachable spirit. I don't need anybody to teach me. Well, then why'd you come here? Go start preaching, and maybe God will give you a church. But that's what Christians think sometimes. I'm sick of being told what to do by this one, that one, and that one out there, so I want to go to a place where no one's going to tell me what to do. Well, listen... This, this is, I'm very, I'm a simpleton. You wouldn't need managers. You wouldn't need police officers. And in the church, you wouldn't need pastors, elders, and deacons if everybody just always did what they were supposed to do. Is that, is that a simple philosophy? Right? Amen. At work, I was a, a manager when I worked at Lowe's. I was on both sides. When I was a manager, I had to tell people what to do because they didn't do their job. And then when I stepped down as the church was growing... Right? I stepped down and then I became subject to the managers. And I, and, I, and I spent a lot of my day walking around saying, why aren't the managers doing their job? Because I used to be one. And then the managers had to come tell me, well, you need to do your job. And I say, well, I used to do your job. And I say, God, forgive me because I'm still supposed to listen and be subject. Because that's what Jesus was. Subject. He put himself under the authority of Rome. As a lamb that was led to the slaughter, he did not even open his mouth. You know why? Because he knew his father was bigger than all that. Listen, I don't like what goes, it, what, what's going on in our country. All right? I honestly don't know 
honestly don't know if in the new building someone's going to try to come in and say, oh, you're putting up a new structure. The building code says that you have to have a, I, I don't even know what you call it, transgender bathroom. I'm, I, I'm serious. I don't know if that's going to happen. That's one of those times where I'll have to say, well, we're a private organization. Unless you make every other private organization in the country do that, which they're not going to do. So we're a little bit of ways away from that. But I'm telling you, that stuff is coming. And when you think about it, listen, he says this, wherefore you must needs, you must be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. You know what that means? Wrath means, hey, it's not the wrath of God, but it could be the chastisement of God through the local powers. He's saying this to the Christian. Don't just do the right thing because you're going to get fined or you're going to go to jail. But do the right thing because you have a conscience that stands before God. Not just because it's restraining you because you don't want to pay that fine or you don't want to go to jail or whatever it is, but do the right thing because God is watching you. Do the right thing because you stand before God. Because God is bigger than all of that. And listen, sometimes it has to be, Lord, I disagree, I'm angry, I don't want to do it, but because you told me to listen, I'm going to listen. And a lot of the time it's like that. But listen, an evidence of you having new life in Jesus Christ and being transformed from the inside out is that you'll have a mind that is willing to be subject. Because I want to tell you something. If you don't have that mind, God is going to put you in places where you're forced to have that mind. He is. He's going to put you in places where you're forced to have that mind. Listen, I remember a pastor friend of mine telling me this as he was battling with his daughter. She was going through her late teenage years and she, she started doing the wrong thing. Wouldn't listen to him. Wouldn't be subject to the, the, the parents, the church, nothing. And eventually she had to be put out and she fell under the authority of the authorities. And she had to listen. But you know what he told me? This is what he told me and I'll never forget it. He says, if I could do it all over again, when my daughter first started going astray and not falling under our authority, not listening, doing the wrong thing, he said, I would have put her out quicker. That's what he said. He said, I would have put her out quicker so she could learn her lesson quicker. Because if you have a heart that is rebellious, if you have a heart that doesn't want to fall under authority, if you have that kind of spirit as a Christian, that's not the spirit of God. That's still your rebellious spirit. And God will put you in situations where you're forced to be obedient. Now listen, with that being said, there's only a few times that you're allowed to be disobedient to the government that is over you. There's only only a, a couple different reasons, all right? If they start telling you you can't read the word of God and if they start telling you you can't preach about Jesus, that's the only time you can disobey. Paul was beheaded because he disobeyed. Peter was crucified upside down because he disobeyed. All the early apostles were martyred except for John and he was exiled and boiled in oil because they disobeyed. But they didn't disobey all the laws of the land and all those things. They only disobeyed when they told them, don't talk about Jesus Christ. That's the only time they disobeyed. And as Christians, that's the only time we can disobey. So you know what that means? That means even if they raise your taxes to 50%, and some of you, not many of you, might be in that tax bracket. You're like, none of us. All right. You have to pay them. You have to pay them. No, it doesn't mean if there's a government structure that's set up that you can, you know, do something about that in a peaceable fashion you should but you have to be subject listen think about it what about your christian brothers and sisters who are in muslim countries that fall under their laws where they're treated like second third class citizens where they get taxed because they're christians in certain ways and the muslims do not what about that do you think they walk around saying we're not going to do that no they do it 
For this cause, pay tribute. That's pay taxes also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, that's tax dollars, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. We should be made up of people that love people. That's who we're supposed to be. So often we're caught as, as Christians in the middle of always being controversial. Really. And I told you this before. If you really are living for Jesus Christ, the controversy is going to come your way anyway. It's just going to happen. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's just going to happen. But don't be a person that seeks it out. Don't be a person that's always stirring up stuff. Don't be a person that's always causing arguments. You know, we get those in here sometimes, and it's always this one. This one just wants to argue about this. This one just wants to debate about this. This one just, why? If you live for Jesus Christ, it's going to come your way. Don't go looking for it. Now watch. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So listen, as Christians, if we're being transformed from the inside out, right, we're going to have teachable spirits. We're going to be willing to be subject, even when it's difficult. And we're going to be people who love one another. Now, he mentions all the second part of the commandments. Why? The first part of the commandments has to do with loving God. The second part has to do with loving others. God had to tell the children of Israel, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't, don't cover your neighbor's wife, don't lie, don't do those things. When Christians start you know, saying to me, you know, we're, we're not under the law anymore. That's legalism. And I say to them, okay, so it's okay for you to commit adultery now, but it wasn't for the Jews. It's okay for you to lie now, but it wasn't for the Jews. Does that make any sense? Absolutely not. He says, if we really are loving one another, we're not going to want to do those things to people. We're not going to want to do those things to one another. If we're really loving one another, listen, if we're being transformed from the inside out, these things are going to come out in our lives. We're going to stop doing some of these things that we used to do. Watch. Love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You know what God says? All of those laws, all 600 and something of them, they were there to teach us. Either do this or don't do that. Because if you really had it in your heart, you wouldn't want to do this. Or that. And we have Jesus Christ in our hearts and in our lives. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says what? what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And you know what that perfect will of God is? Is to what? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and then love everybody else the same way you love yourself. That's the perfect will of God. And then Paul gets very detailed. And he tells us, this is how you do that. This is how you love one another. This is how you love one another, by treating people a certain way within the church. This is how you love the lost world, by don't have a rebellious spirit. Be subject. Because love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Listen, you should try praying this way. We can pray it for our kids, but it's hard for us to pray it one, for one another. We can pray for our kids. Lord, I pray that my son and my daughter is closer to you than I'll ever be. Lord, I pray that my son and my daughter does greater things for you than I could ever do. You know, that's the way we're supposed to pray for one another also. Lord, I want your people to be closer to you than I can be. Lord, I want better things for them than me. See, because that's love. 
That's what Jesus did. Jesus came down. He bore all of our sin. He took all of our sin because God said, you know what? I want for them what is for you, Jesus. I want them to have it too. See, that's love. Because love, listen, love works no ill. Love works no ill. You know what that means? Listen, it means when you look at the other person, when you're looking out at other people, what do you think about them? And, um, and, and it's easy for us to look out and say, yeah, this is where they're coming from. Yeah, this is what they got going on. Yeah, I love them because you love them, Jesus. But I know they're just trying to get this from me. And they're just trying to get that. I know their angles. I know their motives. I know. And you might. But when you look at them the way Jesus looked at them, you know how you look at them? Lord, that's okay if they're trying to do that. That's okay if that's what's going on in their heart. Because you love them. And it's the least I can do to love them the same also. Because love, listen, works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Do you want what's best for your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ? And I, and, and I say this all the time. I know I'm getting out of line in my walk with God in ministry when people become a continual burden to me. Oh, it's a burden. Oh, it's difficult. Oh, it's hard. Oh, I can't take these people. Oh, go to another church, please. Oh, I can't. Can you imagine Jesus walking into the synagogues saying, I just can't stand all you people. Go to another synagogue. Really? But that's what we do. That's what we do. And then, listen, this is what happens in the body of Christ. And then uh, we're a body. We're a family. And then, you know, you start to see some of the same people week in and week out. And you start to get to know them a little bit. And then you start to get aggravated with them. And it's never you. It's always them. It's just how it is, I'm sure, right? And then it's like you start to think things about them. And you think they're thinking things about you. And, then, and that's just, just that's what happens. That's what we do. And then instead of loving them, instead of not caring if they think something of you, but loving them anyway, because love, listen, works no ill toward that other person. We say, no, I can't take them anymore. I can't stand them anymore. Hey, I'll just go to another church. Then you go to another, listen, then you listen. Some of you have done this. We've all done this. You went to another church, and for the first three months, oh, this church is so loving. <laughs> oh, these people are so loving. The usher actually opened the door for me. Well, people open the door here too, but you don't notice that after a few months. Oh, then they, they, you know, they were just so loving and people gave me hugs. Well, people gave, you know, do the same thing here. They give you hugs too, but you just don't notice it anymore because now you know who's giving you a hug a little bit, right? And then a couple months go by and then those things start to happen. And then you're there for three, four, five, six, eight months. And you're like, oh, I can't take these stands. I can't stand these people either. <laughs> and then you go on a search for the right church. And you realize that there's none. Because God takes a bunch of sinners and he puts them together and he says, love one another the way I have loved you. And love works no ill. Love wants what's best for the other person. Look what he says. And he gives an illustration here of being asleep and being awake. And remember the whole context from Romans 12, 1 and 2 has to do with the will of God renewing your mind, being transformed from the inside out. And if we're being transformed, if Jesus is really starting to live more and more in and through us, growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, things are going to be, we're going to look at things a little differently. All that in, the, in that context, remember that. And that knowing the time and that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Look what he says. He tells the church. No, he's not talking about sleeping. Wake up if any of you are sleeping. He's talking about lethargy. He's talking about laziness and your spiritual disciplines. He's talking about being lukewarm. He's talking about just going through the motion, sliding through life as a Christian. That's what he's saying. 
He's saying if we're filled with love and if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be lethargic. We're not going to be sleepwalking. You ever see people who sleepwalk? I've seen my kids do it a couple times. It's like the weirdest thing. It's weird. They're just walking, and they're like talking and crying. They go on these like cry sleepwalks. Talking and crying a couple times. I've seen it like, eh, like they don't even know that they're awake because they're not sleepwalking. They're bumping into things, screaming, freaking out, don't know what's going on. He goes, it ought not be like that for us as Christians. We should be awake. Look what he says. Know the time. It is high time to awake out of sleep. Listen, characteristic, characteristics of sleepwalkers are this. They're numb or sleeping to the fact that Jesus could come at any time and that they might see their Lord face to face and they're numb or they're sleepwalking in reference to holy living. Hear me. Hear me. And we can just take our lives and line them up with what the Bible says. And see what our lives are made up of. Remember when you first got saved, you came to Jesus, you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you heard the gospel for the first time, you heard about Jesus, and you were like, all of a sudden you stopped doing this, and you stopped doing that, and you stopped doing this, and yeah, you know, and everything was like, like it was like crazy for a little while. Like you wouldn't step on a crack, or you break your mother's back. You wouldn't do any of those things, right? Seriously, it was like, oh, yeah, maybe that wasn't the will of God. I got to step over that crack. You know, all that, you were like, you know, just trying to make some changes, and that's good. But if you go too far with that, you, what happens is you start to be known for what you don't do instead of what you do. And then we let, but, but then we let the senses, our spiritual senses, dull. And then we just start to just live like the world again. We live for just, you know, the money and the now and the here and all that stuff. We just start to live for now. Live for your business and live. And all those things are good godly things. But we get out of balance sometime with those things. And then we start to sleepwalk spiritually. And Paul says it's high time for us to awake out of sleep. So we need to ask ourselves, do we know that Jesus could come at any time? Listen, we're not promised the next breath. We're promised eternal life. We're not promised the next breath, though. We could see Jesus face to face. And listen, if you know that you're going to stand before Jesus, what about your life? Do you take continual spiritual inventories of your life? Do you look at your life and say, man, this is not godly. This is wrong. I've let this creep into my family with my kids. All this stuff. Lord, I need to do something about it. I need to do something. I need to get rid of this stuff. Lord, I need to put on more of what you want to do in my life. Listen, we should be going through that stuff all the time. All the time. Oh, that's condemnation, Pastor. No, it's not. It's conviction. Sometimes I'll be driving home and I'll be thinking about my kids. I'll be thinking about the last few months and I'll be thinking about, oh Lord, you know what? I haven't spent enough time with them in prayer. Lord, I, 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 I haven't done any Bible studies with them. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. Lord, help me. And it drives me to my knees and I'm like, Lord, this is too much for me. Help me. And then God says, all right, who do you think put those thoughts in my mind to think about my kids that way? God did. Amen. God did. And, 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 and then I'll be driving and I'll be thinking or I'll be walking and God will be speaking to me. And he goes, hey, you haven't prayed for this person. You haven't prayed for the church. You haven't sought wisdom on this. You haven't sought wisdom on that. Is that just coming from my mind? No, that's coming from his mind because he cares about those things more than I care about them. He died for the church. I didn't. And he puts those things on my heart and on my mind to wake me up so I don't become a sleepwalker. And we can all tell stories of our Christian walks when we've become that way. We can all tell stories of maybe a month or a year or years where we were just phonies. And we believed in Jesus as our Savior, but He wasn't our Lord at all. It's high time. Awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Very simple statement. From the early church till now, Jesus could come at any time. We're closer. Another minute goes by, you're closer. 
The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us. Now listen. When the scriptures say let us, Paul's going to say let us, let us, let us. He says it in Colossians. He says it all through the epistles. Let us. I don't think God would ask us to do something that he is not going to give us the power to perform it. So when it says let us, that means you can't do it. When it says let us do these things, that means the Holy Spirit is ready to empower you to do some of these things or to not do some of these things. Very simple biblical exegesis. So let us, listen, put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Listen, look what he says. Not in chambering, that's lewd sexual activity, and wantonness. That's no holds barred when it comes to your sexuality. And that's, sadly, that's what's going on in the country. But the more we surrender as Christians to Jesus Christ, the more we can make a difference for Jesus Christ. Not in chambering, nor in wantonness. Not in strife and in envy. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Listen to what he says. He goes, let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. What happens in the day? What happens in the day? It's light. You can see things. It's clear. That's what we should be as Christians. You know what that means? That means Christians shouldn't be shady. What does the word shady mean? There's shade, right? You want to hide behind it to get some shelter from the sun. But the Bible says that there is no shadow in God. There's no dark side of God. Sometimes we as Christians, we're so shady. You know what's so sad to me? This is, this is so sad to me. That Christians won't hire Christians to do work for them. Really? They won't. Oh, I can't hire Christians to do work for me because I get taken advantage of. And I'm like, and I listen to the stories and I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's true. But I want to tell you something. Because it happens. It happens in the church. Don't give in to that way of thinking. Don't give in. And then sometimes even pastors and teachers will stand up and they'll say, do your business, you know, separately outside the church, you know, with, with, what unbelievers, you know, because you could treat them a certain way and then, and then there'll be less strife in the church. That's not biblical. Oh, but I've been taken advantage of from a, a, a brother or sister in Christ. I've been taken advantage of over and over again and they said they were Christians and I thought they were going to do the right thing and they just did not do the right thing. So what do I do? Get taken advantage of again and put myself out there again? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't mean you can't speak the truth in love. It doesn't mean there can't be contracts and all of that. Because if you're a Christian, you should say, yeah, give me the contract. I have no problem with that because I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do what I said. I'm going to let my yay be yay and my nay be nay. But it's sad that we can't trust one another. We, we act worse than them sometimes that don't know Jesus Christ. That's sad. Paul says, let us put off those things. Let us walk, listen, honestly, in the day, in the light. Jesus was the light of the world. There should be something different about us. Now listen, as Christians, listen, it doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean you don't sin because you do sin. You do make mistakes. But when you do that, you know what you do? You be honest and you say, yes, it was my fault. I did this. That's what we should be made up of. We shouldn't be sleepwalkers. Growing dull to what's going on around us. <laughs> listen. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's a choice. That's a choice. It's a choice to put off your old ways and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're really being transformed from the inside out, you're going to be willing to say, okay, Lord, have your way. Okay, Lord, I will put myself out there again. Okay, Lord, 
I will go the extra mile. Okay, Lord, I'm willing to lay down my life a little bit more. Okay, Lord, not in strife and in envy. Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing to live the way Jesus lived a little bit. I'm willing to do that. Now listen, we have to ask ourselves, are we willing? Are we willing? Are we willing to put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light? Listen, you ever hear your mother say to you or you say to somebody, your father say to you, when you were going through like whatever, your late teenage years and you wanted to be out till 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. There's nothing good for you out there at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. You ever hear that one? What are you doing out there at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning? There's nothing good for you out there at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. You know why? Because a lot of evil things are done in the dark. Right? And as Christians, listen, we shouldn't be people that are constantly wanting to go out into the dark spiritually. Always wanting to be, you know, walking a fine line with darkness. We should stay away from those things and walk in the light as he is in the light. And Paul says, put off, put off. And then he says, put on, put on. Are you willing today before the Lord Jesus Christ to say, Lord, I've been, I've been walking in this dark, th- these areas of darkness in my life, in my home where nobody, where nobody sees, you know, where I, where I have my secret stash of liquor or whatever it is, or where I have my Bouts of anger and wrath that only people see, only people in my family see, but we hide that really well. Where I lie and cheat and steal in these areas, Lord. Lord, you know, nobody knows about them because they're done in the dark. Are you willing to bring those things to the light? Are you willing to bring those things before God to the light and let Him purge them? Are you willing to do that? Paul says, let us walk. Let us do this. It's a choice. 